grow or grow. So we're we're excited about all that. So we've just started the recording. Welcome to the Milwaukee Water Stories virtual roundtable of September 25th, 2024. Thank you all for joining. Um, my name is Michael Tim. I manage the Milwaukee Water Stories program for the nonprofit Reflow, as most of you know, and have been working on the last year um, to support journalism and illustrated storytelling and video storytelling that are meant to be complementary resources freely available to people in partnership with Urban Milwaukee for the journalism uh, and in partnership with uh, uh, local artist Sarah Gail Luther for the illustrations. And so we um, are, are really uh, pleased to be able to share a, um, a sneak peek at some of the latest illustrations that Sarah has been working on uh, over the past months furiously in many ways. Uh, and then getting your your feedback on what you like, where you could imagine this kind of mode of interaction going into the future. Um, and if you like some of the stuff, you know, and you're you're compelled to share it, then we'd love that because it's about getting the word out to, to different folks and different audiences. So I think with that preamble, we have probably have a good group of folks who are on on the Zoom. And I'm just going to provide a um a quick reminder, refresher of the resource and where it's aggregated. And that is through the Reflow Water Stories page, which I will go ahead and uh, drop in the chat here when I find my chat again. Uh, so that if you aren't familiar, you have access to go to this directly. And all the public facing resources that we are able to share are, are linked here. And then some of the ones we'll share today are, are drafts. So they're not on here yet, but this is where they will live. Um, and so there's a number of articles that have been written over the past year. Um, I'm expecting to submit two more to Urban Milwaukee before uh, the series is done. Uh, a video that we'll give you a sneak peek of here today that is complementary to the Fish Passage storytelling that was done. Uh, one pager illustration that you may have seen earlier that Sarah did on the impacts of salt to water, um, as well as a work with a different illustrator that you may have seen uh, about a year ago um, uh, again, connected to the Fish Passage work, and we're working on an illustrated uh, Teacher's Companion version to this, this resource. So feel free to click on that on your own time. We're not going to go through that book today. But we also have these interactive maps that are complementary to the stories. They're relatively simple. If you click on them, they go to the page uh, that has a map uh, with it. And one of the things that Sarah and I were thinking would be uh, kind of cool and that she really took the lead on was, well, what if we talked to people who are fishing around Milwaukee and just kind of got a sense of who's fishing, why are they around, and what are they up to, and to let people know that this is happening right in the city. So with that, um, uh, I'm going to invite Sarah to go ahead and unmute. Uh, I did pull together some numbers if folks want to look at this later. It's pretty boring for Zoom, but it's kind of interesting just to compare um, how much we're stocking, how much we're catching, where that's happening, what kind of species. And then the uh, the map that Sarah did these lovely little bubblers for shows where she where she went um, to, to capture these different stories. And so Sarah, I'm gonna go ahead and invite you to, to take the floor here uh, to tell us a little bit about these, what we're calling postcards. Yeah, so like Michael said, he was pulling together some data um, that kind of uh, went through how people are using these fishing spaces, what the DNR is doing, just, and we were both kind of curious to know um, kind of who is fishing where and for what. Um, and so the idea kind of came about as like a nice, uh, like a more human side of the story beyond what like the numbers and the DNR information um, to interview some people when they're out fishing. And so it started, I went, um, started early in the spring when trout were running and um, something called suckers, which I'd never heard of before, um, were running upstream and started in Estabrook Park and just started hitting up different parks at different points along throughout the spring and the summer to ask people questions and see what they were fishing for and ask them if I could take a picture um, that I told them that would eventually be turned into an illustration. So nobody felt like their face was going to be on, um, you know, didn't have to look perfect. They're just out fishing, um, but snapped a picture, made some drawings. Um, but it was really, it was, it was exciting to see kind of what people were doing and, and really to hear that most people's stories um, were the same, that they were really just trying to connect with nature, 
they were using fishing as a way to be outside or to just be like in um, in the Milwaukee park system. A lot of people had the same goals. Like nobody was there fishing because they were trying to like feed themselves or um, because they were like big into the sport. I mean, they all loved the sport, but they were mostly being um, present and just wanting to enjoy the water and wanting to enjoy nature and enjoy the recreation of it. So I really, um, I thought that was a pretty amazing connection that pretty much everybody shared. And Sean, who has just popped up, who is the person fishing in Washington Park, he was um, actually just starting a teaching job where he was teaching people in the neighborhood, in Washington Park neighborhood, how to fish. And so um, people passing that love of fishing, but mostly of being outside and um, connecting with nature through this very like peaceful sport, um, I thought was a really excellent story. Um, yeah, the other interesting conversation that came of it that might be information to share in the future that Michael will and maybe touch more on um, is a conversation with Joseph, who was a uh, writing a thesis on fishing in Milwaukee. And he had a ton of really great suggestions of where people tend to be fishing, how people use these different fishing spaces. And, um, and he had pulled together a ton of survey data um, that I'm really curious to see when it, once it's public, so. Yeah, and we had reached out to Joel, Joel Bevington, who's now actually with Sweetwater, um, who had been working with the Center for Water Policy about um, getting access to that report back in the spring, but it wasn't public yet. And so we kind of ran out of time to to dive into an analysis beyond what he publicly presented. But that is a, a great touch point into the future. Like, how are people using the resource that is our local waterways in terms of fishing? What are the barriers to that? How are... Um, how are different institutions helping to overcome those barriers or to make fishing very uh, accessible? Because one of the, and, and partly it's a it's an access kind of challenge that uh, as we learn, um, and partly there is, there are folks who are using uh, fishing to, to supplement subsistence, but then partly it's also an economic and a budgetary issue uh, as folks who have followed DNR are aware of. Um, there is, um, you know, they need, they need, they need to up the numbers of, of, um, either the number of fishing licenses being sold or somehow supplement funding to maintain their, their process because they're running into a deficit right now. So I'm sure those who follow the state budget uh, will be interested to see where, where that goes. But we didn't go into that analysis, but I know that that's happening. So thank you for, for mentioning Joe's report. Um, uh, I just wanna say one more thing about these. We've described them as postcards. And to me, they're lovely uh, little vignettes that kind of tell a story even without words. And so we're we're eager to to work with Sarah to find a way to help her share these uh, as printed pieces that maybe could be you know purchased or or used in gift baskets or that sort of thing. And we haven't fully figured out that distribution mechanism and what that looks like. But if you all on this call find these things of value or of interest, like oh that's awesome, I'd love to put it in an auction basket, or I'd love to have postcards to send uh, my relatives over the holidays or something like that. That's kind of what I encourage uh, you, Sarah, to, to think of as we were building these, because we didn't want to worry too much about the numbers about this, because others have done that. But the idea of these visual vignettes that are kind of nice, um, that kind of can live on. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll find a way to share those into the future. So thank you for your excellent work on these. Um, yeah, it's a fun and, adventure. And I want to then pivot to some other excellent work, which is still in draft. So I do want to... Um, caution everyone that this is this is still a draft and I'm trying to get my zoom back here um, and so Sarah I have the pages version up because I thought that might be easier on the zoom screen but I'm going to make it a little bit bigger maybe well maybe yeah that's probably about right um and actually why don't I do uh I don't think I can full screen and have zoom on so this is about as big as we're going to be but on my side it looks pretty good so I'll provide 20 seconds of preamble and then I'll let you take this away um, we're still working on this, so it's going to look a little different, but it's going to look pretty close to what it looks like. So we're, we're, I'm, I'm pretty pleased about where we are. Uh, Rapid Radicals, uh, and I believe one or two folks from Rapid Radicals may be on the call, so they can chime in a little bit later if they're interested in sharing some of their, their direct story. And I'm hoping to do an interview follow up on some of the latest on Friday. Uh, is a business that started in Milwaukee uh, to innovate a new way of stormwater uh, treatment at uh, overflow locations. Uh, using ozone. And uh, it started in Milwaukee, started after the 2010 storm event. 
And we use that as sort of an inciting incident for this comic book version of how uh, a local uh, engineer in Page, who is who Sarah has drawn uh, in the centerpiece of this draft cover here, um, saw a problem and then innovated of a solution that could become a, a very innovative technology to help you know the world address wastewater concerns. So with that, I'll do a slow scroll, Sarah, and then if you want me to like adjust how I do that, let me know. Um, and I, I think I can do that. That sounds great. So yeah, so like Michael said, so he approached me and asked if we could tell the story about Paige and her business, Rapid Radicals. And um, we spent a lot of time kind of going over the story and the beats and how things went down. And I think from my perspective, I realized that if we wanted to tell this story of like innovating the sewer system, then we needed to make sure that people understood the sewer system. Um, and so, like Michael said, it, we start with a storm in July of 2010, um, which was a pretty big um, weather event for a lot of people. And many people can remember all like, just because it was so epic, the flooded streets and the car in the sinkhole and people's basements flooding. And there was just so many iconic <clears throat> things that happened that were newsworthy during that event. Um, it's a good, it's a good place to start and like jog our memories um, and then start to talk about Milwaukee's sewer system. And then how that was like an amazing innovation when it, when it came to be, um, but that it's not necessarily keeping up with our contemporary times. Um, and so something like Rapid Radicals, this business is an important story because it helps us kind of bring our wastewater treatment into the future. So, um, so on this page, you can see kind of a diagram of how things work in moderate rain versus heavy rain. Um, so we're kind of going through and kind of slowly step-by-step step, telling people about, you know, like here's the system and here's how it's supposed to work but with climate change and with these major weather events happening more often, it's often not going to work. And there are alternatives like we, um, here's another diagram of um, like bringing in the deep tunnel. So like another innovation that happened um, that helps us get a little bit closer to not having to do overflows or people's basements not flooding, but again, like doesn't solve the problem 100%. Um, so walking through people, like walking through this process of like, here's what we have, here's what we've added. Um, but when it rains and if it rains a lot or if it rains one day after the next, like it's, it leads to an overflow. And so this is kind of the page where Paige has an aha moment of like, oh, what if we could clean the overflow? Um, and, and we kind of start to tw twist the system a little bit and we kind of start telling the story of like, how do we innovate from here? So like the system's old, it's not working. How do we move forward? Um, how do we make it more functional? Um, and so we do have a fun timeline. Every good storybook has to have a timeline um, talking about how the Milwaukee Source System came to be. So these are kind of like the building up to um, Jones Island treatment plant and um, building up to the biological treatment plant that we have currently. And then on the next page, we have the sewer socialists um, at the beginning and then going all the way to where we build the deep tunnel. So again, like basing this story off of like this amazing innovation that Milwaukee's had the privilege of um, having in its history. And um, that has really like offered us a lot of really pretty amazing like clean water that's going back into Lake Michigan and clean drinking water that we have in our city but kind of pointing out the fact that it's just like it, it's not keeping up or it's not um, always enough so um, here are some our innovation pages where Paige keeps innovating and keeps building on this excellent system and pushing it forward and um, and so you'll see that the word bubbles are all her kind of like finding partners and doing experiments and being in the lab. But then in the background, it's all the doubts and all the fears of starting a new business and trying to push through um, experiments that may or may not work or like the self doubt that comes with these experiences. Um, you can go to the next page. So we kind of have that the, the Rocky montage style <laughs> for Paige in her building her business. Um, and then we continue on, um, we kind of get to this point in the story where we're starting to show that they are testing 
this model. Like they've developed their business model. They've developed their idea. They're treating the wastewater with ozone. It's working. They have the partners, they have the, the team. Um, and then on the next page, you kind of get a flash into the scientific side of things. So it dives a little bit deeper into the process of what exactly is happening in their little pods. Um, and then on the next page, um, you'll see them kind of piloting the, the pod in its first location on 60th and State Street where they actually get to test it in real time. Um, so it's it's been a honor to tell Paige's story. Honestly, this is just that her, her business really is an epic tale. Um, and what's like, what's next is kind of the big question of the last two pages is so yes, this is piloted in Milwaukee. Yes, this was like built out of a Milwaukee problem, but um, there's so much potential for the system that they've developed to be really helpful for many cities and in many places. So um, it was fun to think about where this could go next and um, hopefully plug into their like dream sequences a little bit and then consider how this functions um, in other cities. But then on this last page, just think about how um, how we're really taking care of our future of our city or maybe other places as well. Um, and this quote, I'm just gonna read it because it was such a great question. Like thinking um, we were on a call and I think Dylan said it, I don't remember. Um, it's coming out of his mouth in the illustration. So we'll go with that. Um, but thinking 100 years into the future, we have a decision to make. Do we rejuvenate a, an aging and failing infrastructure or do we innovate something new? And so that question really inspired both Michael and I in conversations with them um, to really make this last page about, you know, like we do have a really cool source, like wastewater treatment system. And we are doing really amazing things with green infrastructure and we're pushing things forward. But um, it still isn't always enough um, with the amount of people that we have in Milwaukee and with the amount of um, paved spaces that we're creating. Um, it's just a really different landscape. And so just trying to bring that question of like, we really impact the earth and it means that we have to continue innovating and um, being really creative with how we solve some of these problems of humans using the planet. And um, so then the rest of the book is kind of diving into um, more of the nitty gritty, showing the characters, um, explaining more of the science. So, but those are the, that's the main set of illustrations, so. To me, it was important that when we have an illustrated book that we reinforce the idea that this is actually, these are actually real people. Um, because I think sometimes there's a, a mental separation between, oh, okay, that's a cool story and reality. And so with the end matter, I wanted to reinforce that by kind of segueing us from the illustrations that we've just seen to the the real people who are involved in this ongoing story. Uh, and then depending on what kind of uh, readers or audiences may be using this, if they're educators, um, you know, they can use this as a complement to other things, not just one specific business story in Milwaukee, because it touches on um for lack of a better uh term steam science technology engineering art and math all in one all in one place uh and then this is sort of the the end matter that explains that yeah this is a real thing and then for those who are interested in looking deeper at it like there's some real possibilities to the technology based on a review of pages uh dissertation that are suggestive of cost effectiveness and context beyond their their trial. And that was what excited me as a journalist when I was reading through and learning more about their material was, okay, yeah, this is a potentially cool thing and, and everyone hopes it'll succeed, et cetera. And they're they're doing, you know, work to continue the science that is backing their business, which I respected as I learned more about it. But there's also this sort of push and pull between, and Sarah described it nicely with Dylan's quote, like, what are we doing? Like, what are we deciding to do for the next 10, 20, 50, 100 years? And where are we putting our money? Where are we putting our investment? What are we doing in terms of how do we operate a whole society? And I, I think that 
this is just one component of those larger choices, which of course educators could segue into how they would want to frame a discussion. But to back it with some of these numbers and to think about what scaling could mean in different contexts and to think about what kind of risk aversion different institutions may or may not face, um, this is suggestive of those kinds of discussions. And so then here are the, the, um, the general timeline that we may gussy up a bit if we have time. Uh, and then again, with a, with a younger uh, edu uh, education audience in mind, we have some reference points to things that are beyond this story that are very general for those of us in the water world, but very important for those of us who are not. And so this is this is a resource for an educator to just kind of know that they can trust this link as, okay, I know what I'm getting here, um, as well as a sort of a mini glossary that could easily be taught from if someone wanted to use this as a companion to other things that are going on, whether in the field or in the classroom. Because from a Milwaukee perspective, the deep tunnel is a specific thing, but all of these things are generalized throughout um, wastewater treatment in the developed world. So th these are these are terms that could be important to um, to different uh, audiences. And so that that's the the end matter. Uh, and again, we're we're really pleased with the the opportunity to kind of pursue this over a long period of time because it it has taken a long period of time to get to where we are. Uh, but my hope is that this is a perennial kind of resource that really it marks a point in time 2024 which may not be the most critical point in the rapid radical story but it's sort of it is a way to have a um, i'm going to zoom back to the the sewer pages because that's not going away right let's if if, if we want to talk about innovation we also have to talk about it in the context of what's there now and what could a change look like from a system that we're dependent on to something that would be new so i think that these are resources that in complement to what MMSD has already put out there to describe and explain how the sewer system works. I think these are complementary to that um, and hopefully useful to the larger societal conversation. Um, Sarah, is there any other page you wanted me to go back to or anything else you wanted to highlight in this work? And also be aware they are, um, their spreads when they'll print. So uh, this is, it's easier to see the single page, but I flipped through those first ones quickly because that's like the intro. But if you can imagine that you're holding a, a book that is eight and a half by 11 the long way with a, either stapled or spiral bound in the middle. Uh, so some of these pages will feel differently than what you saw on the screen because it, we're talking about an actual book that a teacher or anyone could just print off from a PDF on their on their computer. So we Sarah very uh, uh, wisely sized it so that it would be, you know, would play well in eight and a half by 11, because that's what anybody and their brother has um, at their printer. Oh. So I kind of pr proud of where we are here. So, oh, so, yeah, go ahead. I Sarah. can't think of anything else to go back to or add, but I did want to say that we'll also provide a black and white version without color where people could use it as a coloring book or just print it a little bit more cheaply if um, like the full grayscale is too intense or color is too much. So yeah. there'll be a black and white version as well. And so I'd say we're about 95% of the way there with 90, I'd say we're about 95% of the way on this book. So we're we're cleaning up some things. As you see, it's not perfect, but it's it's getting there. We're pretty close and I'm, I'm pretty pleased with where we are. So thank you, Sarah, so much for your work on this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and segue to our, our video interlude here. Um, so another part of our Water Stories uh, effort that has been supported by Coastal Management has been articles, which are, again are linked on this page and had been published in Urban Milwaukee, um, illustrated material, which will be linked here. So when the Rapid Radical story is ready, it's going to be on this page. Uh, and then also videos that complement this storytelling. So the audio may be a bit quiet, but we're going to go ahead and run this on the Zoom uh, I'm going to go ahead and make it bigger, and then I'll be quiet while it runs. Uh, but this it should be self-explanatory what it's about. But this is complementary to the Clutch Park uh, Dam Fishway project. Uh, remarks from Mark Denning in June of this year. And wait for you, and wait for you. Not away, but easy. Fish the cause. The main to them. On the snowy, home and home and out there in Delaware. Big enough. French English. On the Otago, now the opening of the past. It's 
there was a time in this the history of this place when that was one of the only languages that was spoken. And this place looked very different. The waters behind me just a few weeks ago would have looked this way. You could put your mind here. There would be multiple migrations that would happen in order. That order happens to be a part of our clan system as indigenous people. And what I want to share with you is I am a part of that order and my clan is Sturgeon Pike. What I said in our language was to loan to each of you, my relatives, and to share with you my name, which is about those pine snakes that are on the ground and the thunderbirds that are above the air and all those things in between. It's a pretty big name. And I, I don't think I ever live up to it ever. Uh, it was given to me by, by Waving in the Bun to Nancy, one of the founders of the American Indian Movement, Eddie Benton to Nate. The reason why I share these things is it's not just you know, watching this live and in person, it's also the media, of course, and native people. And when we're given about three minutes to share 10,000 years worth of history, and I now have two minutes, <laughs> I need to establish who I am to you and to those of you who are watching. I am also Medewit, and that means the way of the heart, one of the oldest religions in this state, in this area of the Great Lakes. So I'm standing here watching all of this unfold that is before me, and uh, it was hard not to cry. We can follow the path that are before us. One of those paths is the path of the natural world. And it is here that the path of the natural world is the path of friendliness and brotherhood and sisterhood and a place where we can be the we is coming together. And that we is not just human. That we is our fish, the birds that sing above us and give us song to help us in our morning, to help us in our joy. To be with these fish, the ones that we rarely see, who move through the water as easily as we move through the air. And a space has been given to them. You had heard that other dams are there. Other dams need to be removed. And with each removal, with each fish passing, our communities can be stronger. And when I say our communities, I mean those of our natural relatives not just human. The we is beyond the human. The we is beyond human just standing here. The we is a dad and a mom and a grandma and a granddaughter who come here outside of your view to connect with this natural world and to remind themselves outside the streets of poverty and injustice that justice does live and our creation does have a base and they can see it here and be better for it. And so with that, I'll leave this to each of you and say that in our language is how we say a Lennon and a thank you that this matters, that you matter, and the people that come here, both our swimmers and the flyers that follow this river along their journey, all of them so today was a thank you. War must be done, but we celebrate that war today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we did have to uh, clean a little of that audio because there's a waterfall right behind where he's talking. So thank you for your indulgence with it being a little softer. Let me see if I can segue here so the, the there will be a few more short videos that are complementary to the stories that have come out and that one uh, is the one that is complementary to the uh, fish story series of three articles that all touched on sturgeon reintroduction to uh, the milwaukee river and lake michigan with uh, a focus on the clutch dam fishway as this sort of critical point um and now i want to take about five minutes and share how some of those articles are all of the articles ultimately are being assembled into a, a visually rich document that will be uh made available to folks and when we've talked 
Let's see where my um, camera, oh, there I am. Okay. So when we've talked about a National Geographic um, inspiring, I guess I'm, there we go, uh, inspiring our approach, uh, there, um, this is a draft uh, kind of magazine style document that puts the articles um, all into a visual space and my, it's blurring on the screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk you through just a couple of, the, of how they look and feel, the spreads version on the screen. So if you can imagine like you're looking at a National Geographic, so like the spine is in the middle, but except these are Milwaukee stories. So these have already been published in urban Milwaukee, but we're, um, you know, we're packaging them in a, in a visually rich way um, using other illustrations that Sarah has worked on, including the, uh, the different scales of watercraft, recreational and otherwise on Milwaukee's waters uh, and some uh, wonderful aerial imagery that was shared um, and not paid for through the grant, but was shared through partners um, um, uh, like this one, looking at one of the, the harbor gaps and focusing on different themes that emerged through the, the previous water story roundtables as suggested stories. So I'm scrolling through one of the more recent ones that was published in urban Milwaukee, but this is like the complimentary um, magazine style version of that, um, looking at access and recreation and what different groups are doing. But you can perhaps appreciate that the visual enhancement gives you a different sense of place, a different sense of story, uh, and having it all bound together is kind of one of those things that was important for us to kind of document a number of different water themes that are happening in Milwaukee, uh, rather than just drill into one of them for all dozen plus articles. Um, we took the guidance from the, the roundtable guests on, well, people are interested in different things. That means that we need to kind of spread our bets. And this is a way to assemble those different stories. Showing here a draft of the Green Schools story, which is another one that came out in August. Many are familiar with this story. Um, but again, the visuals tried to put it into a, um, a more enduring context for something that could be picked up in 2025 or 2026 and still has has value to tell the story, even if um, even if it's a few years later down the road. And I'm not sure if um, uh, who's all on the call here today, but I'll, I'll go back and, and glance through some of the other visuals, but we're going backwards, so you can appreciate that. Some of the benches at Green Tech Station, who a number of the folks I think on this call uh, have kind of contact with. Um, one of the videos will, will highlight those youth voices talking about their benches, talking about their process. Um, we're cleaning up the audio on one of those videos. And so this is an, an opportunity to highlight what happened in 2024, but in a way that is useful to talk about a lot of different things, not just in 2024. Uh, and that was the intention, and this is the how the product is shaping up. Um, I think we maybe we had someone from Sweetwater on the call too. So this is the um, story that is related to um, some of Sweetwater's work uh, with respect to uh, working with multiple municipalities on stormwater and trying to put that into you know, this magazine style context. And then I'll just flip through this one as well, which is another one from, from the spring, which some of you may have read, and again, going backwards, but the dredge management materials facility or dredge materials management facility is a is a big topic. It's not going away. It's, it's subject even of uh, an architectural and design focus now at uh, Center for Water Policy, like what's going to happen with the site once it's filled in 20 years, et cetera. So reminding people that this has consequences and that it's a big deal, um, it was part of the story, uh, which focused on Dr. Cool and Aguilar's research uh, into nutrients in the, the harbor. Uh, and so again, able to use some of this wonderful aerial footage that again, we didn't have to pay for, but was shared with us to really contextualize the, the dredging work that was done in the inner harbor um, and show what that means in this larger context. Um, some of the research that was too complex to put into the, the Urban Milwaukee article, there is sort of bonus bonus footage if you want, if you like bonus material in the, the magazine version, um, as well as the, uh, the, the version that was edited uh, by Urban Milwaukee um, graciously by their team. 
So I'll, I'll pause on this one and, and pivot out of this conversation. But from the scroll that you just saw, you can appreciate that there's sort of a wealth of visuals that go with these articles. And even if you may have read some of the articles uh, in urban Milwaukee, hopefully people will be interested in the idea of, oh, this is kind of a cool thing that we could, you could have as a coffee table book, of course, if, if you like, but it also um, is intended to support educational audiences. Um, a lot of the conversations I was having at the Green and Healthy Schools Conference in August with educators, I was I was learning and discovering how they do and don't use different uh, reading materials in classrooms. And it struck me that uh, the question, like, why can't we use local, locally produced or locally focused stories to do some of the general reading checkboxes that different teachers have to do as a matter of course? Uh, my hope is that this is a resource that can be leveraged in that way, both at the undergraduate level and um, in K-12 as, as a teacher would find it appropriate. The short-term way in which this is intended to be shared uh, will be as a, a PDF that is available to people because out of the grant, that's what we said we would do. And as funds allow and if new partnerships allow, we'd love to you know, figure out if, if there's an appetite for some kind of limited run of these, uh, what kind of shape that could take. And if people are interested in something like this into future years for future volumes, is this a model that we want to continue? Um, is there an, what, what is there an appetite for? And so that's a little bit of a segue into our, our next uh, session or part of this round table. So this is the round table part of the round table. <laughs> Uh, we've been feeding you now for a half an hour, and now now we're interested in your in how good you thought it tasted. Um, so, Justin, if you would um, not mind, Justin, I we've put up a few polls. I'm just going to put this up on the background because that's a little that's a little nicer. Um, we've we've put together a few polls that we would invite your feedback on, and they're relatively simple. But just let us know um, if you've read any of the articles. Uh, how many do you think you've read? And again, those are would have been access to this page, or you may have seen them on Urban Milwaukee. So be honest. You know, we're not. I'm not offended if you didn't read any of them. We just want to know, um, like, how far is this going among even our kind of invited group here? So if you would go ahead and fill out that poll, um, and Justin, I'll trust you to decide when to end the poll because I'm not the best gauge of how much our participants. There should be a thing popping up on your screen that has a question. How many Milwaukee Water Stories articles in Urban Milwaukee have you read so far? And you can click 0, 1 to 3, 4 to 6, 7 to 9, or 10 to 12. Um, there's 13 that have been published so far. There's expected to be two more. Um, so if, if you haven't read them all, then you've got more that you might be excited to find. Um, this is partly an advertisement for that as well. Um, so thank you to those who have responded. Looks like most folks have read a few. I'm not sure. Is it giving us lifetime feedback on the screen, or is it something that that's only I see? Uh, it, yeah, it it's only we'll give it a couple of minutes here for okay. folks to go through the whole survey. Our question to Michael um, is one, like a zero, like I'm not attending, and three, like I'm for sure attending, or is like. Oh, oh, all of them are at once. I, I forgot that. Um, just your your general sense of interest. Like, would you actually be interested in coming to one of these? Oh, how many would you? Yeah, interested? like if we if we 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 ran them sort of quasi quarterly, but maybe it's a once a year thing. Maybe it's quarterly. That's what that question is intended to elicit. Like, do people want to spend an hour on Zoom in 2025? Or do you want to spend two hours? Would you spend two hours on Zoom in 2025? Is this worth it to you for that? And again, feel free to say none. And if this is to meant to guide us towards like how valuable is this to the folks on the call? <clears throat> yeah, for me, I just see question. Oh, I see you have to scroll down. I was not thinking that. Okay, got it. So if you haven't figured out like I did, <laughs> You can scroll down to the other poll questions um, uh, to see where what the appetite is. So it looks like there's some appetite for these. Um, and, the, and let's give it maybe another 60 seconds for folks to respond okay. to the rest of the questions. 
Oh, I suppose because I'm sharing my screen, they can see the. I'm in infinite regress mode here. The. And we'll give it 30 more seconds on the survey. Okay, that is uh, the vast majority of us that has responded. So I'm going to end the poll. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. We got actually no, we got everyone participated. Thank you for that. So I'm going to end the poll, uh, and I'm going to share the results with everyone. So now, Michael, everyone should be able to see. Now they can see. Yeah. Okay. So does everyone, or I guess that's a bad question. I am seeing the results of the survey on the screen. If anyone is not seeing this, please chime in. Taking that as, as implied consent that you're seeing the poll. So it looks like a number of folks have read a few articles. A few, art a few folks have read more than a few. So it's good that everyone has read at least one, which is cool. Um, uh, it looks like there is appetite possibly for a biannual kind of thing into the future for like a zoom meeting that's sort of what the appetite of this group is is how i'm interpreting that can you help me in interpret these colors justin yeah so the the third question was about um the water centric city principles which is focused at the city of milwaukee um and we're getting a little feedback here on how people want to um, kind of frame future water storytelling. And so I, I think we need a little bit more time to digest this, but I would say a lot of folks are responding to, to seeing more of the research um, and maybe some more of the arts and talent in particular, which doesn't surprise me because we spent a lot of time today talking about the research side. So, um, 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 but green infrastructure was high on that as so was sustainable, healthy water supply. Got it. So those are our ones and twos. So the more of the blues means that more people voted those ones or twos. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it's mm -hmm. fairly distributed, but that that's a good interpretation of of that. So that's cool. So we we did some things that were interesting to people with what we did so far. Mm -hmm. uh, four was what audiences do you think that you could help share these with? A uh, few folks said youth. A few more folks said educators, which is great. That is one of our hope for target audiences. So I'd love to connect with folks who have a direct line to like share the resource in the way that's appropriate to them. Public, I'm very pleased that half of us are feel like this is a breakfast table or 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 supper table kind of thing. That I'm pleased about that. And then partners, that's really no surprise because a lot of us are partners on this call, but I appreciate that as well. And then we'd love to talk to the one person who has a new idea, or if we want to um, uh, jump in during discussion, it would love for that person to chime in there. And then poll five uh, was attempting to get a sense for like what kinds of media are most appealing. And it looks like from those on the call, the, the appetite was largest for the long form future stories. That was of interest to at least... Um, I still need to figure out how to read these, but to six of, okay, six of nine people. So small sample size, but the articles yeah. were of interest. The illustrated stories were also of, of interest. Videos about the same, but maybe less than the illustrated stories, which had the highest of most interest in them. So that's good to see too, because that's one of the unique things that I think we wanted to bring to this, um, this effort. So I'm glad that there's some uh, four, four out of nine folks thought that was the top thing they were interested in. And then interactive maps, we didn't really dwell on those too much today, but that seems to be the, the complementary rather than the focal point. And then similar, I will invite the, the, the two folks who had um, some other ideas to, um, oh, I probably did the wrong stop share. Um, maybe not. Oh, there we go. Am I still sharing, Justin? I apologize. Uh, no, but if we went through, uh, so I think we're good. Um, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Um, so 
I hope to open this up to discussion on feedback to what you saw today, feedback on any of these questions and like moving the ball and then other story or partnership ideas moving forward. So I think we can operate on a an unmute uh, and or raise hand system for the last 10 minutes here. So if anyone would like to chime in um, to address any of these questions or something you really liked, some a way you'd like to use the, the resources or an unexpected way you imagine you could appeal to an audience, I would love to invite that discussion. Let's see where we are here. I see Dave is unmuted. Are you? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. Sure. Go for it, Dave. <laughs> Hello. Step into the space. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, thanks for putting this together. It's it's wonderful work, and I I love the illustrations. Um, you know, and telling the story is great. And I just um, you know, we have Harbor Fest coming up, and friends at Lakeshore will have a table there along with other partners. And when, one way to get um, you know, the youth involved is a coloring book. So I'm really interested in that. You know how that would look, and um. You know, I don't think it would be all the pages, but what pages might be there and what kind of level of coloring would be needed. So I think that's something that's, you know, one feature that interests me. You know, how do we get kids to stick around at these tables when we have events at the Lakeshore State Park or elsewhere? And coloring is really a good way I've seen to get them interacting. Cool. That's a yeah. great suggestion. Sarah, do you want to respond to that at all? I know that's our intention. At, we haven't focused on that, but that's intended that all of the color things can also be black and white. And I apologize. I was working with a student for a second. I had a question. So um, I missed the beginning of that comment. Oh, yes, yeah, Sarah. Hey, um, David with Friends of Lakeshore State Parks. So I'm just like when we have hi, when we have uh, tabling events, you know, to get kids involved, you know, a coloring book or a page is really, you know, we've seen a great way to get them engaged. So just curious, you know, how many pages you'll have and what level of coloring would be needed, that kind of thing. Um, so do you have anything in mind there? Yeah, I mean, we plan to have the whole book available as a coloring book. So um, mm -hmm. from that, you could take, you know, like just the sewer system page or like just the page on pages like ideas so you could pull one single page or you oh, could use sure. the whole book so okay yeah we would love that that would be okay. an amazing use Great. of the work all right yeah thank you okay it's good to hear there's that interest um yeah i see i see katie has her hand up so if i'd like to acknowledge katie hi yeah i'm, I'm new to the space but um but I, for those who don't know i am i'm the programs and events manager for watermarks um, so yeah, I actually I kind of went immediately to to the tabling too. Obviously, we're at tables a lot, and we're always trying to think of uh, an engaging way to do something ex extra. So yeah, I, the coloring would be pages would be great too. Um, and um, but also, um, so I my position is like somewhat housed in the public museum, and we're still trying to figure out how the public museum like fits into all of this. But I know there's been a lot of discussions of like even housing, um, like you know the um, Milwaukee River Keepers um, like robot over the winter, and so I'm just like thinking like what else goes around that right? And so obviously like just even having the illustrations, having a little book for, so, you know, to have like X other, other things around um, and like, and this, and, and that might, I don't know if that would be this winter or in the winter future, but I just know that they're, they are obviously invested in telling um, and educating folks about water at the museum. Um, and so I can just see this being a natural fit there. So happy to kind of like, connect the dots there and, and see what's possible. That's great to hear. Um, and I, I would love to continue that conversation. Um, it, that I, The museum has obviously been an, an inspiration for this kind of work over the years because of like a diorama approach to uh, the visuals, especially in the, the earlier uh, book on the Clutch Dam Fishway. Um, so all these resources, it would be great to have feedback from and continue to explore how they could be shared, used and shared by the museum because you have a different level of reach. So 
Yeah. And actually a question about like the, uh, the, like the, are they like the, the first thing that you showed, are they postcards? Like, can they turn in because postcards? Is it like something that you could be like, send a fishing story to a friend? Uh, Cause I could also see that being like a fun thing, like writing a note, like, I don't know. I, I feel like there's, there's something, I, I mean, I don't know if kids are as <laughs> into writing letters I feel like it could be really cool like what is this old-fashioned way to communicate with people um but I feel like I still love getting mail so <laughs> so it could be a fun thing where there's even just like a little drop box and like people write notes and fill it out right there or something and that could be at tabling too really Sarah I see you smiling did you want to chime in on that yeah, I mean, those are great ideas. I think we're, again, we're just open to however people want to use these, these resources for like spreading the word about Milwaukee's waterways. So yes, let's do it. And in the short, I see two folks with hands. I just want to make one comment. Uh, in the short version, we have to figure out how much printing budget is left to do some stuff in the short term. And then I think if there's folks who have printing budget that are excited about this, like let's talk because that's going to be the, a hurdle to overcome based on how all the things shake out. Um, I saw Paige's hand first, so I'd like to acknowledge Paige. And Paige, you're muted yet. Um, oh, Paige is furiously typing. Okay, hi. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time. I just wanted to say that, that this is really cool and that it's been a really great experience working with you guys to get this. And Sarah, you're so talented. And Michael, the way that you translated, you guys translated this difficult topic into something that honestly even helped me find a better way to explain it and describe it. Um, I'm just like honored and thrilled to even start to visualize the way that uh, telling a story like this and visualizing a story like this can help create a relationship to water for Milwaukee and beyond's youth. Because that's like, that's where we want to be building these connections to our infrastructure and everything is at that younger age. And sometimes it can be really difficult to access it. So that's it. I just, my two cents on that. It's very cool. It's always very emotional for me to see it uh, like all written out. And I'm uh, really grateful that we get to work with you guys on this. So We'll, well promote I'm, it. We'll promote the heck out of it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm very appreciative of all the time. Uh, and I, I just want to say that we, we find your story inspirational. And I think partly it's to show young people that there is a, you know, a young woman from Milwaukee who has gone through a lot of different steps to do something pretty amazing. Um, and part of that is doing science in an academic context and then going beyond that. And I think that that is one of the powerful meta stories that we don't, we don't need to say that in the book because it's just there. But I feel that's how this also has an appeal to folks beyond those who care about the sewer system. Maybe they care about um, empowering young women in science or in any level of academia. Um, this is a small thing in that space, but it's a, a real person in a in our real city. And that's what's important to me. It's not somebody out in New York or California or in a studio somewhere that we're manufacturing it um, or manufacturing it here. So I, I, that's what has kept me going during parts of this process. But thank you for but, sharing your story. Yeah. And it's a story that includes so many, so many stakeholders from the Milwaukee area, which is like this, the, the partnership power piece is, is crucial. So it's, it's really cool. And then uh, you guys did a great job. Which is the other meta story. Um, and yeah. uh, and so I see that Sally has raised her hand. I want to acknowledge Sally. And then I'm also, we'll get to this comment in a moment. So Sally. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, I just want to say this is beyond exciting. It, you know, it's what you want to read if you were a, a child looking for the, your favorite book or if what you'd like to be able to share with another um uh, family member. I'm part of Friends of Lincoln Park, and we had Sean, that happy uh, fisherman in one of the stories, and he was just that. And I think one of the things that helped us was the partnership. Lincoln Park is is um, uh, a beautiful space for fishing, and we had Urban Ecology Center come, and that was a gift. And I, 
would like to use the materials that were created to get more families to come in. I know people want to come, they just need some invitation. And I think a postcard is an invitation to an event would be wonderful. Um, I do think people don't write the old fashioned way of writing letters, but we can always send them one. Um, and, I, and I just appreciate too about getting women involved, looking at it as solutions for something that we all live with. I always have a hard time describing MMSD, but you really helped because we should understand. And now I have a picture that I can share with people about how, how, how we live with the water that we pollute and how we want to get it back and how we want to bring in the fish and we want to look at how we're all connected. So and in short, we had the canoe mobiles in uh, Lincoln Park on Saturday and we spent uh, Thursday and Friday panicking because there wasn't any water. Um, and that's another part of rivers is how do you talk about what what is a normal river? Um, and it rained just enough Friday morning that we got people out, the canoes, the canoes had fewer people. But the idea was that we had a real decision about how safe is the water and what's normal. So we're part of the AOC. We're getting all the cleanups of, and, and sort of the redirection of the river. So it's a perfect story to tell about how how you face challenges. Um, and then it rained, of course, Sunday, so it made it, now it's fine. Um, but I think part of what this what, what this whole uh, idea of storytelling just makes it so easy to spread. I think we're all looking for stories to explain something. We don't like words. We don't like even you know movies. We want something that really shows. So cartoons, those things are just exciting to everybody. So truly, thank you. I'm, this is very exciting. Thank you, Sally, and thank you for that positive energy. And also the the idea of the invitations being powerful to partner groups is something that I hadn't explicitly thought of. So I, I appreciate that as a suggestion for how we might even suggest those who aren't on this call could consider using some of these resources, even if it's not a hard sell. Um, so happy to have those conversations for what pieces of this puzzle you would find most valuable for that kind of invitation, because I would assume you're not wanting to print every last thing that we've shared on the screen today, but maybe some of the things are more useful than others. And to the extent that we can parse some of that out for individual uses, I'm happy to make that happen. So thank you for that interest. I noted um, Jessica uh, has a comment about special collections. Did you want to unmute or did you want me to? Okay. Oh, cool. no, that's fine. I just didn't, I was wanted to be sensitive to time and then I couldn't find my raise hand button. But uh, Max Yella often, like if I go to Max and I, I do you know Max? In no. the universe, UWM libraries, he owns the rare books collection. And then he collects like print arc, you know, portfolios and ephemera, all of that. So he's UWM's like ephemera person. Um, so I think that he would be delighted to see this. He would probably also organize like to repeat this presentation to the whole UW um, community through the uh, the library because it connects with digital humanities, you know, just all these other connections. I think that it could be a really either bringing him, inviting him to the next roundtable or making an appointment to show like all of the printed materials he would probably offer to both, you know, either purchase things from you or give you a budget for larger, you know, print editions. Um, if the library could then hold one of all of the editions or something like that. I mean, there he would be super excited about this and he would also really pay attention to the story so that it becomes a teaching tool and uh, can exist for as long as the library is here to record this project. So the, cool. just an archiving. No, that would be, that would be wonderful. Um, I would say we'll be there by the end of the year. We're almost there now. So like at the right moment is probably in a month or month and a half or sure. a month or two, but I would love that because that is very much aligned with where we are. I do want to respect time. We're at 431. So if anyone needs to jump off, please feel free to jump off without any, um, harsh feelings right now. But if anyone wants to continue the conversation, I'll hang out for another few minutes. Um, thank you all for attending. Um, the, uh, I think we can find out who attended and I can send the link as a follow-up in case you want to share it with your partners who weren't able to attend um, and point them to a particular part of the YouTube when we get it up there. That might be a way to, to share this. Uh, and then um, if you're not already on the Milwaukee Water Stories newsletter, I try to send those out monthly and I'll, I'll mention this as well. And then in the next couple months, look for the finals uh, of the Rapid Radical story and then a few more videos that encapsulate some of the material that uh, we've worked on earlier in the year. So thank you all for attending and have a good afternoon.